Hi, I'm Anthony Newbo. Welcome to A Closer Look. In the midst of the lingering disaster that was Dorian, we got some good news about Grand Bahama tourism this week. And so my guest is the Minister of Tourism and Aviation, the Honorable Dionisio Diagula. Minister, welcome hey. again to the show. Ace, hey, thank you so much for having me. Listen, finally, the Grand <coughs> Lucayan has been sold. The uh, opposition continues to say that it was a bad deal. The government lost money. Government says the exact opposite of that. So let's start with the numbers. Let's clear up the numbers. What are the facts? So the government of the Bahamas would have purchased the Grand Lucayan for $65 million. Uh, we sold the hotel for $50 million. But we have insurance proceeds to receive um, from, from the hotel, the damage caused by Hurricane Dorian. So we're selling it for $50 million and we're anticipating and in getting insurance proceeds of approximately $15 million. So 50 plus 15 equals 65. So in our opinion, it's a wash. We bought it for 65. We're selling it for 65. You had some operating expenses. Clearly, uh, when we took over the hotel, uh, we had to operate that hotel. And there's no secret that that hotel operated at a loss. In fact, it operated at a loss uh, long before we acquired it. And the government of the Bahamas, under the PLP and the FNM, was pumping in 10 to $20 million a year to keep that hotel open. So we knew that there would be operating losses when we took it over. But to us, it was fundamentally important to keep that hotel open. And when Hutchinson Wampoa came to us and said, look, we're done with this hotel, we're out of here, we're gone, the Bahamas government made the decision to step in, to acquire that hotel, to hold it for a short period of time and sell it onward to a reputable purchaser. And for, for a long time it appeared that that sale wouldn't happen, and for any number of reasons. So, so take me through, take us, your views, through that process of getting yeah, Absolutely. I mean, sale. I think that uh, when, we, when we acquired, we, we were reluctant to buy the hotel. But we bought it anyway because we felt it was important that that hotel not close and turn into the disaster which is the Royal Oasis today. Yeah. Where they allowed a hotel to close and you see what you see, an abandoned building with no economic impact. So we felt it was important not to make that mistake again. So we bought the hotel and we all agree governments should not be in the business of running hotels. And so that's why we were initially reluctant. But we waited and made the hard decision to acquire it. We held it for roughly 18 months. We obviously incurred the losses of operating that hotel for 18 months. But now we've sold it on to a, a reputable purchaser. You've got the Royal Caribbean, you've got the ITM Group, well-funded, well-managed, have a record of successful projects in the tourism industry. I couldn't think of a better purchaser. You would label those negotiations complicated, difficult, but necessary? You know, every transaction is complicated. Everybody wants the best deal for themselves. And recognizing that, you know, Grand Bahama has been in, 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 in a, not a great economic place for many, many years, we felt that this was important to uh, consummate this sale to provide the catalyst for the redevelopment of that property and to bring optimism to the Grand Bahama economy. If you have a purchaser such as Royal Caribbean, an ITM, buying this hotel and committing to invest $300 million in this project, that's good news for Grand Bahama. And these are companies that have delivered on tourism projects not only in the Bahamas but across the world. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons I, I said complicated mm. and quite possibly very difficult, I'm thinking of all of the players involved in, in Grand Bahama. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. You had the government, you had the, uh, uh, the, uh, the purchaser, Royal Caribbean ITM, you had the port, and right. you had Hutchinson Wampoa. So all of the stars had to align, all of the agreements had to be uh, are made at the same time because this project is really in, in two sections. First is the acquisition of the, of the hotel from the government. It's pretty straightforward. And then obviously they had to strike a deal with Hutchins and Ports and the Port Authority to, 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 to bring about their project at the port. So they're going to build a cruise port 
in Freeport that is projected to receive two and a half million passengers every year. And they're going to buy and redevelop the hotel, create a water attraction there, have 500 rooms in the first phase and another 500 rooms plus villas in the second phase. So it was complicated in the sense you had all these parties negotiating with one another and we all had to align, which we were able to do uh, Monday past. Uh, for all the discussion about what had transpired, the whole process, the negotiating process, and what ended up with in, in the sale of the property, the government, I take it, will lay this HOA on the table of the House of Assembly. This free national movement government has never not laid uh, heads of agreement. It is the mantra of the opposition to immediately say, show us the deal, show us the deal. And we will pick the time when we lay it in the House. We will obviously build it up and we will lay it in the House for everyone in the Bahamas to see. I think it's a fabulous deal. I think it's a great deal. And everybody will focus at the outset on the expenses that we may have occurred. But I invite everyone to look into the future and to recognize the revenues that we're going to receive. So, for example, there are two and a half million cruise passengers that will be coming into that port. The head tax on them alone is $18 per head. Do the math. That's $45 million every year in head tax alone. And then you've got the VAT receipts. You've got the passengers coming in on excursions, going to the restaurants, um, touring the island of Grand Bahama. Think of the 3,000 employees that are going to be employed either directly or indirectly. The economic impact of this project is huge. Yeah, because my next question was, I would venture to say, uh, without any sensible uh, contradiction, that the people of Grand Bahama and the residents of Grand Bahama really don't care. That wh what they want is for this project to be up and running after so many years of just poverty down there. Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, tell me, talk some more about what the government and the people of Grand Bahama should expect from Royal Caribbean and ITM. So Royal Caribbean and ITM are obviously going to acquire the hotel. Mm -hmm. They're going to invest a substantial amount of money in redeveloping that hotel, rehabilitating that hotel, creating new attractions there. You have to create an attraction at that hotel in much the same way that Saul Kersner created an, an attraction at Atlantis. Obviously, this won't be on that scale, but right. you understand the concept. So they're going to create a fabulous water park there. They're going to redevelop all of the rooms in the, in the in re renovate and refurbish all of the rooms in the, uh, in the Breakers uh, um, um, Tower. And they're going to create a retail and casino options, right? So this is going to breathe new life into this project. This is going to create a, a reason for persons now to come to Grand Bahama to stay at a wonderful, new, fresh, recently rehabil rehabilitated project, hotel. Then you've got the port. They're going to build a, a brand new cruise port and you add this brand new cruise port to the brand new cruise port that Carnival is going to build. Yes. And you've got an enormous amount of economic activity. So two and a half million passengers are going to come into the Royal Caribbean port. Mm -hmm. A million passengers are going to come into the Carnival port. You add the three and a half million you get the total is three and a half million. Right now they have 650,000. So you yeah. can imagine the opportunities in transportation, moving these people around the island, going on excursions, going to food and beverage outlets, which this government has insisted are owned and operated by Bahamians. Yeah. So this is going to create a lot of economic activity, not only for persons pursuing careers in the tourism sector, but these are pursuing a lot of opportunities or creating a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs to own and operate their own business. We can talk some more about it, but we got to take a break and we'll be back with more after this. Welcome back to A Closer Look. Anthony Newbold speaking with Minister Dionisio de Aguilar, Minister of Tourism. You're talking about what's happening over there in Grand Bahama and what, what you expect. And I'm, I'm thinking that tourism-related businesses, the other tourism-related businesses, ought to benefit quite a, quite, a, quite a bit from what's going on. I am incredibly optimistic about the future of Grand Bahama. Mm -hmm. These two projects, the Carnival transaction, the Royal Caribbean transaction, and of course the acquisition of the hotel, together are going to be the catalyst for so many opportunities for Grand Bahamians, not only in employment in the tourism sector, but also in 
more importantly, in the creation of new businesses, to cater to all of this, all of these new passengers that are going to be descending on Grand Bahama. So my message to Grand Bahamians is, is get ready. Yeah. There is going to be uh, an incredible amount of business. And, you know, I listen to Grand Bahamians talk, right? And they're very skeptical. You know, they've been promised and stroked and, 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 and led to believe that this could happen and that could happen. But what I like to say is that these companies, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, ITM, are reputable companies, well-funded, had tremendous success creating um, um, venues for their passengers. Mm -hmm. And so I am very optimistic. I am, I am, I am uh, encouraged that these projects are going to come to fruition. And if you circle back to the transaction itself, you know, I'm sure that um, persons who are not in support of this deal will try to focus on the expenses that we would have occurred to make this, to, to, to bring this project about, to focus on the concessions. And all I'll say is, first of all, every deal has concessions. And second of all, look at the potential revenue and business, not only for the government, but think of the 3,000 people that are going to be employed. Think about all the, the, the government receipts in terms of VAT and head tax on, on, on cruise passengers. This is transformational. Yeah, because you're talking about not only residents at Freeport, yes. which is what everybody focuses on, but certainly the entire Grand Bahama and the entire Bahamas, if you think about it. Absolutely. You're you, and you're talking about what's happening down there in Grand Bahama. You just signed uh, the 50, what is it, $580 million agreement in South Abaco over there, uh, Disney and its plans for South uh, Elutra. So, so tourism in the Bahamas is looking up. So notice the difference between this government and previous governments, right? When we enter into transactions with cruise companies, this government has made a point of we're not going to um, um, approve any private islands, these remote islands, where there is limited economic impact. So look at the projects that we've approved since we've come to office. We've done the Disney deal in South Eleuthera, bring some economic impact to South Eleuthera. We've approved the Virgin deal in Bimini, create some economic impact in Bimini. And we've done the two deals in Grand Bahama, one for Carnival, now one for Royal Caribbean. All of these transactions have been in population centers because this government has made the decision that any future cruise projects are going to have an impact on population centers, not on these remote islands. And you speak to the South Abaco deal. Yes, this is a, uh, uh, an incredible um, transaction, um, going to bring a significant amount of investment to a, uh, a, a part of Abaco that has seen very little economic impact. It's going to create a, uh, a beautiful five-star, low-density um, project, going to create a cruise um, a marina for very large um, um, cruise ships, going to lead to the rehabilitation of the airport at Sandy Point. Um, I think it's, it's, it, it, it is, it's a great project. The investor is very motivated, uh, seems to have a wealth of experience in the tourism sector, having owned his own hotel chain, and has scoured the planet and decided that South Abaco is the portion of the planet and the portion of the Bahamas that gives him the greatest economic opportunity. So I'm very excited and very encouraged, uh, not only by the, the size of the project, but, but, but by the passion of the developer. Yeah. Um, and you can feel that in his, in his bones every time you meet with him and how motivated he is uh, to bring this about. So I'm very encouraged by that as well. Talking about the port, what's happening with the port in New Providence? So the deal has been signed mm -hmm. um, the second week of November. Um, the Nassau Cruise Port Limited took over the operation of the port, and they are finalizing their plans for the redevelopment of, of, of the port of Nassau. So I want to sensitize Bahamians to the fact that, you know, when you look around the Bahamas, all the other ports in the Bahamas are being redeveloped. Carnival building a new one in Freeport. Royal Caribbean's going to build one in, in, in Freeport. You have uh, a Royal Caribbean's Co uh, a Perfect Day at Coco Key. You had MSC open a new one at Ocean Key. You got Carnival pick, uh, fixing up uh, their um, island in Eleuthera. Everybody's fixing up their ports. So we couldn't just leave Nassau to languish in the state that it's in. So we entered into a transaction to bring about a three, 250 to $300 million investment in that port. Everybody knows that it needs to be done. It is the 
the port that creates the most economic impact on Bahamians. It is in the center of our country, in the capital uh, of our country. 3.6 or 3.8 million foreign visitors came to the Bahamas through that port last year. 10,400 passengers each and every single day of 2019 came into the Bahamas through that port. So it is absolutely critical that we fix it up. And the beautiful thing about that deal is that Nassau Cruise Port Limited, which will be the operator of that port, will be owned 51% by Bahamians. It's a concession for 25 plus two years, so 27 years in total. And Bahamians will own 51% of that concession. No other concession in the Bahamas has been granted like that. Even at the Linden Pending International Airport, 75% of the debt that was put up was owned by foreigners and only 25% uh, by Bahamians. But the Nassau Cruise Port Limit, we're going to ensure that Bahamians have 51% of that concession. And let me be abundantly clear, I, <laughs> we're not selling that port. It's just yeah, a concession. I, 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 well, I'm glad you explained that because, yeah. you know, the member for Angleston says you've given it away for 50 years. Um, the member of Angleston, I mean, you know, she's a lawyer and I'm, I, I'm at a loss at where she gets that conclusion, but she's entitled to her opinion. And obviously her objective is to muddy the waters, but it's for 25 years. And plus, if the government decides at the end of 25 years it doesn't want to renew the concession, then there's a two-year transfer handover period that will uh, take place and then they're gone and the government can award it to someone else or the government can take over the operation of the port after the $250 million investment would have been done. Tourism numbers are still looking good, looking better once these projects take off. I mean, obviously, if you look into the long term, yeah. I am very confident yeah. uh, that the numbers will continue to grow. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we have this short-term issue uh, known as coronavirus. That, that, that's where I was going with that. Yeah. Uh, and because you, there's got to be some concern, uh, certainly for all these people coming in through ports and on ships with this virus. Well, you know, I think every single person on the planet is reassessing their travel plans. I think even if I'm in the Bahamas, I mean, I've heard many Bahamians say they were going off on a trip here and are going off a trip there. And they said, boy, this coronavirus is, 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 is out and about. I don't know where that's going to lead. So I'm going to shelve my travel plans. So if we are making those types of decisions, you can imagine that everybody on the planet is, is making those types of decisions. Now, what impact will that have on the travel, travel to the Bahamas? It's too early to tell. Yeah. But I'm sure that it will have some impact just based on the way Bahamians are reacting to this to this yeah. virus and, and how they're adjusting their travel plans. I'm sure everybody on the planet is, is making those adjustments. Um, certainly, we are looking at countries around the world mm -hmm. and seeing where the outbreak, out, outbreak is, is most impactful. Yeah. So China, Iran, South Korea, and Italy. And we've said anybody who has been to those countries in the last 20 days sh are not allowed into the Bahamas. We're gonna talk some more about that and close it off, but we gotta take this final break and we'll be back with the Minister of Tourism after this. Welcome back to A Closer Look. I'm Anthony Newbo speaking with Minister Dionisio de Aguilar, talking about this virus. Uh, is there a plan to increase screening at the airports? You're talking about those countries where you go, we really don't need you to come at this point, but are you gonna increase screening at the airports and seaports? So what happens is we inform the world mm -hmm. that if you have been to these destinations in the last 20 days, you are not allowed to enter the Bahamas. So as a first level of defense, right. we have the cruise ships, we have the airlines, right. and they're supposed to vet um, these passengers um, before they even get on the plane or get on the ship to come to our destinations. That's the first line of defense. Obviously, when you get uh, to uh, the Bahamas, um, you are screened and you are asked whether you've been to these destinations. Um, I guess you can go through your passport to verify whether that has, you know, whether they've been to any of those countries. Um, but th th those are our first and second line of defenses. So we don't want anyone to even turn up here who has been to any of those countries. And I think the airlines have, uh, have been doing a fairly good job of screening. Mm -hmm. uh, and and when, when they, you know, 
miss someone, obviously we have our immigration officers um, to protect or to provide the last line of defense before they enter the jurisdiction. So, um, you know, we are taking the steps um, that, that we think are best. And certainly the Minister of Health and the Ministry of Health have all sorts of contingency plans. God forbid one yeah. should slip through. Yeah. So they are um, definitely um, uh, training all of their people on how to, to deal with, with, with passengers or persons that present with this virus and how to ensure that they are quarantined and the, 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 the effect, if God forbid it should arrive here, is limited and contained. Yeah. And those people who, uh, who had planned to go to Italy or wherever, is it likely that we will get any of those people who would say, I'm not going to go over there. Maybe I should just stop over in the Bahamas. So you're absolutely right. Uh, there are persons in the United States and South America who would have considered a, a holiday to Asia or to Europe. And now they're thinking, wow, either I stay at home, uh, I'm just not going to leave, or I'm just going to redirect my business to a safer region. And the Caribbean feels that it's a, it's a much safer region. Um, it seems as if this, this virus... Um, um, it, in, it uh, is not as impactful in warmer climates, and we have had a, uh, uh, um, no incidences in many of the Caribbean countries. So this is causing those visitors who would have gone to Europe or Asia to consider the Caribbean as a possible destination for their conference, for their convention. Um, and so we'll see. It's still, I mean, this, this story evolves every single day. There is a new twist and a new turn so I may be talking today, and in three or four days, it may be a whole different story. So we'll just have to wait and see how it evolves, but we're concerned, and we're on top of it. Yeah, and I, I've not heard anyone really talk about this particular segment. Ports, official ports, fine. you got a huge yachting communi community. Well, you know, the Bahamas is a very open country. It, it there is. are many ways to enter the destination. Uh, and you can come by your private boat, by your private plane, um, you can go into multiple islands and in all of that. And that's what makes it, it's, it's a complex issue. Yeah. Um, but we are training all of the customs officers and all of the immigration officers um, to ask the right questions and to screen people appropriately. Um, and so we feel confident that as best as we can, um, we're going to prevent um, the arrival of this virus here. Um, the Director General of the World Health Organization has said, you know, in every country on the planet, it's inevitable it's going to come. So get ready for it. Yeah. Um, so we are making our contingency plans in, in, in the event that it happens to present itself at our door. But we're certainly taking the steps to try and prevent that from happening, obviously because of the impact it would have on our tourism sector and on our economy. Let's hope and pray. One of the vehicles for delivering tourists to the Bahamas is Bahamas Air, national flag carrier. Had a little challenge earlier in the year. Is that sorted out yet? Yes, there was, a, there was a navigational instrument that needed to be installed in the cockpit of the plane in order to allow it to fly into the United States. Uh, there was some disagreement on whether it had to be in by December 31st, 2019, or at some later date. Um, I, we discovered near the end of the year that it had to be in by the 31st of December, 2019. Um, and so we moved as expeditiously as possible once we learned about that hard date to make sure that that navigational instrument was installed in the cockpit. And uh, by the third or fourth week of 2020, um, that necessary piece of equipment had been installed. So thankfully, January is a slow period of the year for Bahamas Air. You know, it's after Christmas, everybody catching themselves. And so they um, wanted to allow for the equipment to be installed. And once it was in, uh, within three weeks or four weeks into January, uh, the uh, aircraft were once again allowed to fly into, into the United States. So it wasn't, it wasn't a long, and, and it certainly didn't impact our schedule at all. Uh, no reoccurrence, we hope, plans are in place to prevent that from happening again. Yes, I think that, they, that, that, that the problem has been identified. It was once it was, 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 was seen to be a problem, uh, the board and the management moved quickly to correct it, and within three or four weeks, it, it, it had been removed as a problem. We'll stay in there as we come to the end of this. Airspace. Last time we talked, we talked about monetizing the Bahamian airspace. Where are we with that? So let me explain what the monetization of the Bahamian airspace is. Uh, every day, 13, 14, 1500 planes fly through our airspace, and they're not paying a dollar. 
to fly through our airspace. We're one of the few jurisdictions on the planet that don't charge people to fly through our airspace. And I think a number of people have identified that this is a possible revenue source. If you want to fly through our, our, our airspace, you should pay. And so we have engaged in a, a number of discussions, and I, we finally have a way forward, and we all agree that aircraft should be charged. And they're waiting for us to charge them. Now, the mechanics of how much to charge, how to charge, needs to be worked out, you know, based on the size of the aircraft, um, the number of passengers on the plane, do you charge by the mile? There are many ways that you can uh, uh, um, calculate uh, how to charge. And we are in that process. We're receiving, since we've never done this before, we're receiving advice on how to structure it. Um, and then what you would do is you would go to the, uh, it's called IATA, the International Air Travel Association, and you present your plan to them. And then you have to give the airline six months mm -hmm. to add it into their tickets. Because obviously they pre-sold tickets, and right. so they need to have the ability to recoup that money. So once we fi finalized our plan on how to charge, then we'll go to IATA, which is the airline association, and then they will be given six months to implement it. So I'm, I'm hoping and praying that by the beginning of 2021, we'll be in a position to finally start to receive um, uh, 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 money for airlines flying through our airspace. Good place to end. Thank you. And thank you for watching A Closer Look. Remember, you can watch us on YouTube and on Facebook.